This video is brought to you by Finimize. Mega Projects viewers can test a seven day free trial with Finimize. What is it? It's a premier finance app that helps you invest with confidence, which is a good thing. More on them in a bit. As you make your way south from the darkly brooding Granada in Spain's Andalusia region, the road pitches through a truly delightful part of the world. With blossom trees dotting the hillsides and a distant whiff of sea air, it's easy to get caught up in the romance of this intensely passionate, yet incredibly relaxed region of Spain. With the Mediterranean quickly approaching, the mind wanders, painting a delightful image of untouched beaches and small Andalusian whitewashed towns. What actually appears, though, is a little bit different, and by a little bit different I mean it's entirely different. At first they appear like a mirage, white sheets blotting out the odd patch of landscape, but steadily the numbers increase until they are all around you. These are not sheets. This is Europe's largest concentration of plastic greenhouses, as they cover a mind boggling amounts of land. First started in 1963, the greenhouses have spread quickly, now encompassing an area measuring roughly 40,000 hectares, it's about 98,000 acres. That's two-thirds the size of the entire city of Chicago. In some places, they stretch quite literally as far as the eye can see, and the shimmering white expanse is even visible from space. In terms of intensive farming, they are spectacularly successful, providing the continent between 40 and 50 percent of its fruit and vegetables, and earning the area the nickname the Garden of Europe. The quantity of produce varies considerably, depending on which source you look at, but it is generally between 2.5 and 3.5 million tons every single year, which is worth about 1.2 and 3 billion euros, about 1.4 to 3.5 billion dollars. So yes, this is big business. In terms of environmental preservation, the list of problems is steadily expanding, and with murky stories of slave labor type conditions for the mostly immigrant workforce inside the plastic, this has become a hugely controversial topic both in Spain as well as across Europe. The idea of vast, ugly greenhouses destroying the beautiful natural landscape and the hellish conditions for the workers inside is probably enough to turn most people off already. However, and this is a really big however, it's perfectly conceivable that places like this wouldn't even exist if it wasn't for our insatiable desire for cheap fruit and vegetables all year round. Walking through a supermarket in a rich European country, it's likely you won't pay even the slightest attention to the mounds of different produce available throughout the year. And not only that, it's cheap. It's really cheap. Perhaps even a little too cheap, but more on that a bit later. We're starting with this point because it's important to understand exactly why the greenhouses in Almeria exist. They are spectacularly ugly, probably contaminating the ground around them and the site of highly dubious employment practices. But fruit and vegetable consumers in Western Europe have to take part of the responsibility. The greenhouses around Almeria produce roughly 65% of the tomatoes, 80% of the cucumbers, and 94% of the eggplants sold in Europe. The chances are you are buying produce from these greenhouses without even realizing it, assuming you live in Europe. Much has changed in Spain since the swinging 60s. First of all, they weren't quite as swinging as other parts of Europe or in North America. Francisco Franco, who holds the questionable distinction of being Europe's only fascist dictator who actually succeeded, retained an iron grip on the country from the end of the Spanish Civil War in 1939 until his death in 1975. While other parts of Europe barreled forward after World War II, Spain didn't. Thanks to a deep suspicion of liberal economics, the nation faced bankruptcy during the 1950s. In 1959, broad reform began with the economy, certainly not politically or ideologically. This led to what has become known as the Spanish Miracle, a period between 1959 and 1974 when the economy boomed across the country. In terms of economic growth, only Japan outdid Spain during this time. And it was during the Spanish Miracle that we saw our first greenhouse appear in the Almeria area in 1963. The word greenhouse probably brings images of small glass contraptions placed somewhere at the 
bottom of a garden. What first appeared in the 1960s was entirely different, as are the modern greenhouses, but we'll get to that a little later in the video. Polythene greenhouses were first used on the Canary Islands and in Catalonia as a replacement for the more expensive glass versions and with great success. The transparent material proved excellent at retaining heat and humidity, enabling farmers to double or even triple production because the plants inside didn't need to rely on the natural cycle outside. These early greenhouses were incredibly basic, with wooden posts or a simple metal structure beneath the polythene that stretched across the top. At first, it was simply small farm holdings popping up sporadically throughout the area. But by the 1980s, things really started to pick up steam. This had always been a dry and barren area, with as little as 20 centimeters of rainfall each year. The landscape was such that it even managed to double as the American West, with numerous spaghetti westerns being shot there, including the good, the bad, and the ugly, and fistful of dollars. Outside of the western genre, Indiana Jones and The Last Crusade and Lawrence of Arabia also used the parched landscape as a cinematic backdrop. But traditionally, this was an area very few employment possibilities. The expansive process of intensive farming also began in the 1980s. As farmers and large businesses flocked to the area, new methods of farming were needed to satisfy the demand that was already skyrocketing. This included importing soil from other more fertile parts of Spain, as well as the eventual introduction of large-scale hydroponic systems which could drip water and fertilizer into the plants at a steady rate. It has become increasingly common for plants to not even grow in the soil beneath the greenhouses. Instead, huge numbers of grow bags were installed, and currently about 90% of the produce grown there is done so in an artificial soil known as enarenado, composed of clay, manure, and sand. The greenhouses in Almeria began to take on an entirely more industrial feel, and were quickly pumping out fruit and vegetables at breathtaking speed. When Spain joined the EU in 1986, they were able to sell goods all around Europe tariff-free. What had once been a deeply impoverished region was now absolutely booming. But unsurprisingly, this is where the problems really began. But let me tell you something that is not going to be a problem for you, in fact is going to be a big benefit. That's today's sponsor, Finimize. Finimize is a brilliant new app that shares a wealth of financial news and advice so that you can take advantage of stocks and money markets and all that financy stuff that your friends are always talking about. And maybe you're thinking, oh, Simon, I studied art history in school. I don't even know how to read a checkbook. Well, one, <laughs> why are you still using a checkbook? It's 2020. Well, no problem, Finimize wants you to be your own financial advisor, and it's giving you all the tools that you need to invest confidently and intelligently. And it's all news and advice that is written in plain English, using words that regular people like you and I can actually understand. Not all that finance gobbledygook. Personally, I like the daily brief. Like, like a lot of you guys, I'm pretty busy. I make about 4,000 videos a day, and I don't always have time to keep track of every little market movement. Finimize does that for me in a quick little daily section, and it's available as a text article, but I like the audio format. Just pop in those little air buds and give it a listen. They've also got these cool packs. There's actually over a hundred of them that offer in-depth profiles on industries that you could study before making an investment decision. Plus, there's premium insights that break down market opportunities as they happen. Now, right now, you guys can get a seven-day free trial and 20% off the cost of the premium yearly subscription by clicking on the link in the description below. And that seven-day trial is completely free. You can cancel at any time and you won't be charged anything. So, if your money isn't working for you and you want to change that, or if you just want to give yourself a crash course in investing and finance, check out our friends at Finimize and let's get back to the greenhouse. One of the biggest criticisms consistently leveled at the greenhouse complex for the past 20 years has been the treatment of those within this vast plastic jungle. While the majority of the businesses are Spanish-owned, you would do well to find any Spanish citizens toiling away in the temperatures which can reach 45 degrees C to 113 Fahrenheit. The overwhelming majority of those working in the greenhouses are immigrants, some with the legal right to work, some without, most coming from Africa or Eastern Europe. 
Now, first of all, there are no doubt plenty of business owners across the area that treat and pay their workers fairly. But those are not the kinds of stories that tend to make the news. It's not uncommon to see groups of people waiting at the edge of towns in the hope that somebody is looking for some extra work. They generally receive between 32 and 40 euros, that's 36 to 45 dollars a day, lower than the national minimum wage of 55 euros. And it has become increasingly common for overtime to simply disappear from the final paycheck. Even those who have the right to work in Spain will often not speak up in fear of retribution. It's impossible to know the true number of those working within the greenhouses, but a conservative estimate would be at least a hundred thousand people. Conditions within the greenhouses can be difficult to gauge and do vary considerably, but it's generally believed the workers are exposed to harmful pesticides regularly. In 2019, a 27-year-old Moroccan man working in the greenhouses died after complaining of stomach ache for a week. An autopsy confirms the cause of death is poisoning. The investigation is still ongoing. And the difficulties for these workers continue even after they leave work. Many live in shanty towns dotted around the area, some in appalling conditions. In February 2019, a fire from a gas canister burned down half of one such area, leaving 120 workers homeless. What has been rebuilt resembles a refugee camp with freestanding structures, loose plastic, and often no running water. It is a truly bleak setting, and one that should probably stick in our minds the next time we trawl for bargain basement fruit. If you speak to the owners in the area, it's clear where they believe the problem lies, with the large multinational corporations who buy the produce. With profit margins increasingly squeezed, most agree that it's inevitable that some farmers just began cutting corners. The cost of everything from fertilizer to seeds, from plastic to hydroponic systems has gone up over the years. That is, except for the price of the produce, which has actually fallen. While large supermarket chains across Europe are recording massive profits, things are getting harder and harder towards the bottom, and it's become appalling for those picking the produce. The local government has consistently maintained that employment standards are met within the greenhouses. However, the catalog of negative news stories over the years it just tells a different story. Whether this is simply just a few bad owners or indicative of a much larger problem is not entirely clear, but driving through the greenhouse area, it's difficult to get a sense that this is how things should be done. Our desire for cheap fruit and vegetables throughout the year has created an uncomfortable problem that many choose to ignore. While the greenhouses in the south of Spain might be the largest such example, they are by no means the only one. These greenhouses can pump out produce at a staggering rate, and no doubt it has made a good number of people incredibly rich, but the implications of it are all very stark. It's thought that around 5,200 tons of chemical waste is dumped in the area or in the Mediterranean Sea each year. This is a slow-moving calamity that has now been in the public eye for at least 20 years, but it could be another 20 before we know the full extent of the damage. It's believed that around 30,000 tons of plastic waste is created each year, with much of it left to slowly decompose in large pits. Water sources have become blocked, while some have even taken to burning the plastic sheeting and so releasing toxic fumes. Then there's the issue of working conditions within the farms, which come with exposure to pesticides, which will likely take years to show their full effects. But actually, amid this ugly scene, there is some good news. Many farms in the area use sophisticated water recycling systems, which calculate exactly how much water is required per plant. This has meant that, despite being home to some of the most intensive farming on the planet, Almeria uses significantly less water per capita than most other regions in Spain. In a slightly quirky turn of events, the University of Almeria have found that the vast ocean of plastic is reflecting so much heat into the sky that it's actually cooling the province. Temperatures around Spain have been climbing steadily for decades now, but in Almeria, the temperature has dropped by an average of 0.3 degrees Celsius every decade, something that is actually quite extraordinary. As I said at the start of the video, it's easy to view the greenhouses as this monstrous stain on the Almeria landscape, but the truth is, they're just providing a steady supply for our ravenous demand. We tend to look upon factories or manufacturing centers as dirty, ugly places that ruin the surrounding area. But as long as we consume or use what comes from them, it's difficult to take the high road. There are a huge number of negatives, but also some positives that have come out of the Great Plastic Sea in southern Spain. It has created its own economic miracle in an area with little to no financial value before it all began. The way technology has been harnessed to produce such staggering amounts of produce is truly astonishing. Food production is set to be a huge issue in the future, and if we continue in the same way, it's likely we'll start needing many more areas like this. But the negatives 
they are substantial. The conditions that many work under are far from what we expect in a first world country, and the sprawling slums that have appeared near the greenhouses are shocking to witness. The effect on the environment is going to take some time to become fully clear, but with vast amounts of plastic waste and decades of large quantities of pesticides, the future is not exactly bright for this patch of Spain. While many farmers have attempted to modernize and use methods as ecologically sound as possible, it might just not be enough in the long run. The vast greenhouses in Almeria have shown us what can be possible with intensive farming, and it is impressive. But it's equally clear that such practices come with a high cost. The question is, how much is our cheap supermarket produce really worth to us? So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, smash that like button below. Please do check out our wonderful sponsor, Finimize, making these videos possible. There is a link to them below. And thank you for watching.